Hey, it's Professor Wills back with you. Just wanted to finish up our discussion of Romanesque sculpture. Um, as we know, the Romanesque period um, is a period associated with the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and a, it's known and gets its name from this whole return to working in stone, whether stone masonry to build the myriad of pilgrimage churches um, for devout Christians of the era, but also in terms of their embellishment through sculpture and sculptural reliefs. Now, we were visiting Saint-Pierre, a very famous uh, destination um, for those looking to embark on a pilgrimage journey, but it also featured an abbey and a cloister where we uh, admired all kinds of fantastic beasts and, uh, of course, the Romanesque fear that if everyone didn't do atone for their sins, the world would uh, literally go to hell in a handbasket and be taken over by a myriad of monsters. Now, we were also visiting uh, the portal program of sculpture, including the tympanum, which I'll show you as a recap um, in just a minute. But supporting that portal um, as a pillar element between the double door entry of Saint Pierre um, is also not just any ordinary column or pier, but another surface of exterior embellishment as we start to see in this period of the Romanesque world, the decoration for churches not just happening inside, but outside as well to motivate those to enter and be good Christians. So without further ado, let's finish up where we left off with Saint-Pierre. All right, minimizing myself, pulling up that familiar PowerPoint of our art history survey class here at Pasadena City College. And what you find here is um, this, the south facing portal of um, Saint Pierre in France, in Lozac, yeah, dating from 1115 to 1135. Uh, last time around, of course, we focused on this lunette shaped sculpture called the Tippinum. This is a theme of Judgment Day, of the second coming of Christ, where Jesus is going to judge everybody whether they're worthy of getting into heaven or, or hell. So it's pretty strong messaging. No more Christ as good shepherd, as the gentle gatherer of, of, of his flock. Um, he is now the judge of everyone's destiny um, when he um, is believe to come back someday um, to judge of one's souls, um, whether you're getting into heaven or hell. So Christ as a door literally to salvation, right? It's a firm reminder in a very serious era where um, everyone was afraid of um, uh, tripping up and ending up um, in the fiery pits of hell. All right, now below that, is a pier here and we're going to look quickly at what's sculpted on its face um, but also more significantly what you can find sculpted um, on its side and both of those are examples of sculptural reliefs just like the tippinum itself so if i can race through these slides give you a better image here here you can find what i'm talking about here so um what you find initially um, are these X-shape elements. Now, these are supposed to be um, the interpretation in the 12th century of lions, but they form this X-shape pattern along the face of this column. And of course, Gaul, you know, throughout the many weeks we spent together examining uh, the ancient world, we know that lions are often uh, gatekeepers, whether to, you know, fortresses or palaces or citadels. Uh, you know, lions are powerful creatures, king of, king of the jungle, so to speak, and uh, not surprising to see that animal featured here. And it's highly stylized, though, in a, again, a surrender of naturalism, of, you know, the priority not being on observing an actual lion and capturing its naturalistic um, features. Um, instead, it's presented in this X shape pattern. So design rules over naturalism. This is very common in the medieval world um, that we've been studying all along. Now, if we move to the side here of this same um, uh, portal support, you see that the side of it 
is carved as well. Again, we're looking at limestone as the medium. And it's here that it's very interesting you find along the length of it a depiction of an Old Testament prophet. Um, it might be Jeremiah, it might be Isaiah, nobody's for sure um, determined which one it is. Um, but as we've talked about, whether you see depictions of Old Testament kings and queens, references to the Old Testament. Remember, Christ is in that image of the tippinum above all of this. Um, connects the past, the before, to what happened in the New Testament. So if you look at this um, prophet, he's holding, and you can see it in the enlargement on the right, a scroll, one of those rolled up um, documents that's unfurled. And the idea is that his prophecy, as a prophet, his prediction would be related on the surface of that document. And of course, that connects to his prophecy of the Savior coming um, in the form of Jesus. Um, so to render this, what's interesting is you can see that he has this sort of dazed look. It looks like he's in a trance, as if he's in the midst of of receiving this prophecy or generating this prophecy. What's also interesting is we also see an X-shaped pattern going on here with his hyper elongated legs. I mean, this prophet looks like he's been stretched like a piece of um, chewing gum uh, to fit the length from top to bottom of this um, portal post. Um, Again, the idea is not to render a human being with accurate and naturalistic proportions like we saw in the Greco-Roman world. Remember, in the medieval era, this pendulum swung away from that and they you know, accepted um, strange dimensions, particularly for holy beings because they should look otherworldly and supernatural because they're different from us average mortals who are vulnerable to sin, right? Um, and that explains why you see this sort of stylized uh, presentation of this prophet. You can also see um, how though the fabric clings to the body, it's really um, an opportunity for design as well. It has lots of pattern and linear um, elements that add texture and richness. You can see that in the enlargement of the beard as well and his kind of over the top you know, mustache that you see would definitely be the winner of any mustache contest nowadays. Um, but the, the linear treatment, that wavy repetition of line is again more describing, we recognize it as a beard, but it's an also uh, very much strong use of pattern play and line that we met um, in the earlier uh, medieval era in the illuminated manuscript tradition where abstract design was very common, um, but eventually married into the Christian tradition. So you have a melding of abstract pattern and design with figurative art and Christian messaging as well. And so this is what you find here with our Old Testament prophet, um, an example of um, raised sculptural relief, um, feet flattened to kind of keep them from chipping off in an unnaturalistic pose as well, but um, a recognizable holy figure that's been distorted in an era where that kind of distortion would have been accepted. Um, and revered. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for joining me.